Bibles to the 50th Psalm, Psalm 50, and we'll read verse 5. Psalm 50, verse 5. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Gather my saints unto me, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Who is speaking these words? Please read verse 1. The mighty God, even the Lord, hath spoken, and called the earth from the rising of the sun unto the going down thereof. The mighty God is speaking these words from dawn to dusk. From where is he speaking? Verse 2. Out of Zion. Praise the Lord. Out of Zion, the mighty God is speaking. And he's saying, gather my saints unto me, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. We can have many revelations from that verse. But in particular, when we look at it, we can see that it is a type of the coming of Jesus. Where the mighty God is saying, gather my saints unto me. Jesus is coming soon to gather his saints. Who are these saints who are being gathered to him? In this verse, we see a particular quality, a beautiful quality of the saints who will be gathered to him that day. They are saints who have made a covenant with him. Saints who have made a covenant with him will be found in his presence that day. What is a covenant? A covenant basically is an agreement. It's an agreement between two parties, maybe two individuals or two groups. It's a covenant or an agreement between two parties to do or not to do something. So it's a kind of an agreement. Maybe it's a verbal agreement, but a more formal way is a written agreement. There must always be two persons involved in a covenant. Always two persons. The word covenant is actually a legal term. And it binds these two people to be faithful to the covenant that they have made. If there is no covenant made, then whatever is being spoken can easily be broken. So a covenant is made in order to strengthen that decision or that bond. For example, marriage. Why is a covenant made where marriage is concerned? A proper marriage is a marriage that is made with God's counsel and it is made in the presence of God and in the presence of the saints of God and we see a covenant is made. Why? Why is there a covenant made at marriage? Because if there is no covenant for the rest of your marriage, you will find there are so many occasions where you are tempted to break off, tempted to go away. But at all such times, you will remember, I made a covenant. I made a covenant in the presence of God. I made a covenant in the presence of the saints. Even if I may be feeling like this, I have to be faithful to the covenant that I have made. If you have not made any such covenant, as practiced in the country, if people just live together, what happens? Then there is no value to that relationship. And that is what we see going on in the world today. There is no meaning to that relationship if there is no covenant. A covenant gives us three things. First of all, it gives us a ground upon which to stand. Secondly, it gives us a relationship upon which we can count. We can depend on that relationship. We know there's a covenant involved and therefore we can count on that relationship. Thirdly, it gives us a goal toward which we can work. We can work towards a goal because the covenant has been made 
we have a destination. Even the devil knows the value of a covenant and that is why those involved in witchcraft, they know that they have to make a covenant. You can't just walk in and join a band of witches and say, I want to be part of you. In order to be part of them, you have to go through an initiation ceremony, certain rites in order to be part of them. And that is why the word for a band of witches, in fact, 13 witches, when they get together and meet, that meeting is called a coven. It's called a coven, meaning they come together. It's an agreement. Once that covenant is made, the person becomes part of that team, that group, and it is very hard for them to break off. People who have been in witchcraft, even though they come to Jesus and repent of their sins and confess their sins, they will struggle for a while because of the covenant that they have made. So they need to go through a process of deliverance where they have to break off that covenant because even the devil knows the value of that covenant. God also honors covenants. And in fact, God deals with us only through covenants. If there is no covenant made, there is no relationship with God. That is why we talk of him as the God of covenant or a covenant keeping God. We read in the Bible of the everlasting covenant. We read of the covenant of grace. We read of the covenant of an everlasting priesthood. We read of the book of the covenant. We read of the blood of the covenant. We read of the mediator of the new covenant. We read of the surety of a better covenant. Why all this? Because the Bible is a covenant Bible. If you have a Bible, it is divided into two. The old covenant and the new covenant. We call it the Old Testament, which is the same thing. It's a covenant that God has made with his people. God always makes covenants with his people. And when he does that, what does it mean? As I told you, a covenant basically is a relationship or a decision between two persons, God and man, enter into a covenant. What is that covenant? When God makes that covenant, he says, I promise to do something for you. Now, what is the difference between a promise and a covenant? When God says, I will lead you, that is a promise. When he says, I will lead you if you follow me, that's a covenant. Why? What is the difference? The first is a blank promise. I will lead you. That's it. The second is a promise with a condition. I will lead you if you follow me. I will lead you if you obey me. I will speak to you if you decide to humble yourself. So God says, I will do something if you can comply and come meet meet the agreement meet the terms of the agreement so god is making a covenant but he expects something from us when he makes it and that is why in scripture we read of seven major covenants that he made we read of the old covenant and the new covenant that he has made in general but in particular there are seven major covenants i will just state them for you the first is the Adamic covenant, the covenant made with Adam. We'll just read that verse alone, the others I will just state. Hosea chapter 6 verse 7. The Adamic covenant is the covenant made with Adam. Hosea 6, 7. But they like men have transgressed the covenant. There have they dealt treacherously against me. Where is Adam in that verse? Are you reading it correctly? Yes? Yes. Is that verse wrong then? If any of you has a margin, what does it say? 
Anyone says like Adam? Hands up in your margin. Oh, plenty of hands. Okay. Like men, that is actually like Adam. The word for men in Hebrew is Adam. It is translated as man. You are man. You are Adam. So they, like Adam, have transgressed the covenant. So God had made a covenant with Adam. God had made a promise to Adam. And it was a promise with a condition. And God's promise was seven blessings given to him. We've been through that before. Seven blessings given to Adam. But Adam had to be faithful on his part. But what happened? Adam broke the covenant and Adam lost all those blessings. The other covenants that God made are the Noahic covenant, which is the covenant made with Noah. We can note down Genesis chapter 9, verse 8 and verse 9. Genesis 9, 8 and 9. The Abrahamic covenant, the covenant made with Abraham, is Genesis chapter 17, verse 9. The Mosaic covenant, which is the covenant made with Moses, and that is Exodus chapter 19, verse 5 and verse 6. Then there is the Davidic covenant, the covenant made with David, Psalm 89, verse 34 and 35. And there is the Palestine covenant, made with the Palestinians, or the Jews actually. Romans chapter 11, verse 26 to verse 28. And finally, the new covenant made with us as individuals and a church, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 8 to verse 13. Now just for those of you who tried your best to write down and you've got gaps there, I'm going to go through it all over again so you can just fill up the gaps. I'm going to go through it quickly. The Adamic covenant, Hosea 6, 7. The Noahic covenant, Genesis 9, 8 and 9. The Abrahamic covenant, Genesis 17, 9. The Mosaic Covenant, Exodus 19, 5 and 6. The Davidic Covenant, Psalm 89, 34 and 35. The Palestine Covenant, Romans 11, 26 to 28. And the New Covenant, Hebrews 8, 8 to 13. When we see this, we understand that these are some of the major characters in the Bible. Adam and Abraham and Moses and David, Noah. God did not just speak to them. He entered into a covenant relationship with them because that is our God. He makes covenants with groups and he makes covenants with individuals. He has also made a covenant with us as a church. And if we want to enjoy the blessings that God has in store for us, we need to enter into a covenant relationship with him. There are some blessings anyone can enjoy. Even the sinners are enjoying. The Bible says he's kind even to the sinners. Sinners enjoy blessings from God. They enjoy good health. They enjoy good weather. And if God takes even that away, then the sinner will realize even that came from God. There are some things he just gives it. You know, like you get the metro paper and this paper and that paper. You find it everywhere. It's free. Anyone can take it. But... If you want the blessings he has kept for the church, for the bride, then he can give it to you only if you enter into that covenant relationship with him. That is why in the Bible, in the New Testament, we read that we become his children, first of all. Then we become his sons, we become his brothers and sisters. And then we become his wife and his bride. It's all about a relationship with a covenant. So, this is about God making covenants with us. But in the verse that we read, God says, Gather my saints who have made a covenant with me. Can you see? This is something else. When God makes a covenant, He promises and we keep a condition. But now, we have made a covenant with God. What is that covenant? Lord, I will do this, I will do that. Maybe 
you have said, Lord, if you do this, then I will do this. And you entered into a covenant relationship with God. What we must think about is, are we faithful to the covenant that we have made? When we make a covenant, we may even forget it. We forget that we made a covenant and we're living quite happily. Some we can have peace and I have good, a good conscience. It's not good conscience, it's a bad memory. So we must think, you know, some people have this wrong opinion. They say, even if I am not faithful to the covenant, still my God is faithful. Amen. I heard a Amen, which I know is a child, but I also heard a Amen, which is an adult, which is wrong. If you say, even if I am not faithful, God is faithful, it means you haven't even understood what a covenant is. Because for a covenant, it takes two people to make a covenant, but it takes only one person to break a covenant. If you are not faithful to the covenant, then there's no point if God keeps his side of the covenant. So we must think about our faithfulness. What does the Bible say about the woman who forsakes the covenant of her God? In Proverbs chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. Proverbs chapter 2, 16 and 17. To deliver thee from the strange woman, even from the stranger which flattereth with her words. Mm which forsaketh the guide of her youth and forgetteth the covenant of her God. She forgetteth the guide of her youth and forgetteth the covenant of her God. And when you see the description about her in the rest of the verses, you can see she is going down the path of destruction. And we heard that in the prophecy also. Read it. For her house inclineth unto death and her paths unto the dead. See, her house means her family. Because she is going to lead her family to follow her in her decision. She is going to go to paths which lead to destruction or paths that lead to death. Carry on. None that go unto her written again, neither take they hold of the paths of life. Mm. That thou mayest walk in the way of good okay, men. Okay, that's enough. So we understand that when we forget the covenant that God has made. Maybe you're a mother in the house. And you have made a covenant and you forget that covenant and now you start making decisions. What will happen when you forget the covenant, you will go astray from the covenant and according to this verse, you will go down the path towards destruction and you will take your house with you also. So we must therefore give a lot of value to the covenant that we have made with God. Now what gives value to our covenant? Or what must we do to make our covenant count? That is what we read in Psalm 55 again. Gather unto me, my saints, those who have made a covenant with me by... By, do you remember that verse? Sacrifice. By sacrifice. God doesn't say, gather all the saints who have made covenants with me. He didn't say that. He said, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. So understand, there must be a covenant and then there must be a sacrifice. There must be a sacrifice to give value to your covenant. Now for example, you may make a covenant with the Lord in a time of sickness. In a time of sickness, maybe you're having a terrible sickness. At that time, you make a covenant and say, Lord, if you heal me, I will never miss a single Sunday for the rest of my life. What is that? Lord, if you do this, then I will do this. Now, this is a covenant. It's not just a promise. If you say, Lord, I will never again miss a Sunday, that's a promise. But here, it's a promise with a condition which you are making. Lord, if you heal me, then I will never again miss a Sunday. What is that? Is that a promise or a covenant? That's a covenant. Now, 
Many people make such covenants. Is God impressed? Probably. God is pleased. But he doesn't say gather the saints who have made that covenant with me. Gather the saints who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. So what is that sacrifice? Okay, listen. You made the covenant with God. God listened to you and God healed you. Now God healed you, you're faithful to your covenant. Two weeks later, you have the most brilliant job offer. But you have to work one Sunday a month. What do you say? God, you understand. You know my need. You know the need of my family. You are after all my father, my earthly father wouldn't mind. How much more, Lord, you won't mind? Oh, I thank you, you're better than my earthly father. Who's speaking? You are speaking. He didn't say all those things. You are made speaking for God, making up your own God. I don't know which God this is. You have now found a very convenient way to break your covenant and you whitewash it. It's now in gloss, so beautiful. It's now you have broken the covenant. What have you done? You made a covenant, but you're not willing to make the sacrifice. What is a sacrifice? Yes, there's a brilliant job offer and I have to work on Sunday. But Lord, I made a covenant with you. So I am willing to lose that because I made a covenant. Willing to lose something that is called sacrifice. You're willing to lose something. You're suffering that thing. Where you lose something... Because of the covenant you have made, that covenant is of value. Hallelujah. A covenant is of value because you are willing to lose something. Many of you read the story of Daniel. You read of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. You read of that miracle in the fire. It's a fascinating story. How in the fire they were walking loose. It's all beyond understanding it's beyond nature supernatural event they're walking in the midst of fire they are not burnt their clothes are not burnt even the smell of fire is not on them that's a fantastic miracle it, it's fantastic indeed but what touched my heart is not what happened in the fire but what happened before the fire the fire was so hot that it could kill the strongest men seeing the men die these three boys, they should have been really scared. But you know what they said? They said, our God will deliver us. And even if he does not deliver us, we are not going to bow down. In other words, we are willing to stand for the covenant we have made with our own life. Even if we have to lose our life, we will stand for the covenant we have made. They made a covenant by sacrifice. Can you see the value of that covenant? Making a covenant is easy. Breaking it is easier. But if that covenant must have value, we must be faithful even when that covenant is tested. So the covenant is tested. A covenant which is not tested is a covenant that cannot be trusted. We must therefore be willing to lose something in order to Keep that covenant. Only such saints who have made a sacrifice to keep their covenant will be gathered unto him when he comes. Gather unto me my saints who have made a covenant by sacrifice. How many of you have suffered some kind of loss because, uh, because of what covenant you made? Maybe you've made a covenant. Lord, I've got this heart problem, back problem, head problem, this problem, that problem. God, if you heal me, what, did you, what is your covenant? I will stop. If you give me life, then I won't die. My hair. If you give me life, I won't dye my hair. It's a covenant. And then what happens? 
God gives you life. Now you're not dying, you're living. But what happens now? You have to now face a difficult path. What is that? You start aging. Within, within probably two months, you age 10 years. And people may come and ask questions. They may ask. They may reproach you. They may say things to you. But you say, it doesn't matter. Let anybody say anything. Now that is called a covenant by sacrifice. You have lost something. You were holding on to something. You gave it up for the sake of Jesus. The moment you face that reproach and you bear it, immediately you are a saint who has made a covenant by sacrifice. But what if the moment, the first time, someone comes and says, Oh goodness gracious me, I never knew you were this old. That's it. I'm going to go back to my bathroom. I'm going to go back to that bottle. By the way, I don't know how you do it, but someone told me he uses shoe polish. Now, I, I don't know. M maybe you do that. I don't know what you do. Anyway, it looks like that anyway. So, so if, you, if, if you just go back to the bottle because someone has made fun of you. So what's the value of that covenant? There's no value because you are now not valuing the covenant you made with God. You're giving credit or value to the words of a man. So you made a covenant, but it is of no value. A covenant is of value therefore only where there is a sacrifice. Another word for covenant is a, a will or a testament. It's a legal term as I said. And what does the Bible say? Or what does... Uh, the law say if there is a testament or a will then for that will to have value the person who made the will must die you read Hebrews chapter 9 verse 16 Hebrews chapter 9 verse 16 For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. Okay. Where a testament is, then there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. Now, all those are big, big legal terms, but let me just break it down. Where a person makes a covenant. Now, I understood all this only when my grandfather died. I was told when my grandfather died, I was getting his house. Then I had to go through all this paperwork and everywhere it said, testament, testament, testament. Only I said, I never knew he was such a good Christian. They said, it's nothing to do with Christianity. It's a legal term. Testament means he has written this house to me. So he gave this to me. But for me to gain that, he had to die. So where a covenant or a testament or a will is made, someone has to die. What is the covenant Jesus made with us in the New Testament? It's called the New Testament or the New Covenant. And for that what happened? Jesus had to die. It is by the death of Jesus that the New Covenant or the New Testament has power in our lives. That is why we keep going back to the cross. That is why we keep going back to Calvary because the covenant that God has made is a powerful covenant. Even the devil trembles before that covenant. Why? Because of the sacrifice of Jesus. If we are suffering from sickness, if we have had a family problem, or if we have gone into some kind of sin, whatever that situation might be, praise God, there's a place where you can run to. That is called Calvary. That is why a covenant gives us a ground to stand upon. It gives us a relationship upon which to count. It gives us a goal towards which we can work. Thank God for Calvary. Therefore, the new covenant is of value. What about the covenant we make with him? If we make a covenant with him, there must be some kind of death in us also. That is why there must be a sacrifice, some kind of suffering, some kind of loss. Many make that covenant, but they don't want to suffer. If we say, make a covenant with the Lord that you will spend some time with in prayer. What do they say? Okay, Lord, hereafter, I make this decision, Lord. Definitely, Lord, 
I will pray five minutes every day. Now that is a covenant, but there's no loss. Five minutes. It's like, you know, God is coming with a bowl and you throw a few coins in. If you make that covenant, do you know what happens? I remember when I made a covenant with the Lord when I was in school, I said, Lord, I will give this time to you. That's the time when all the good stuff happens. So much temptation to avoid that time. But when we give a time to God, we must also do everything on our part where it may involve even suffering. But we have to be faithful. If you read Philippians chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 and verse 8, look at St. Paul's decision. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Okay, here is a covenant. Jesus, for your sake, that I might win you. If you promise that I can have you, then whatever is gain for me, I will count as loss. Now for example, suddenly you have this desire. Now from the testimonies we heard today, all the testimony, we know the believers, they have some spiritual desire. They want something from God. God, I want to become like Jesus. So what happens? God says, if you want to be like me, then you stop doing that. And you say, okay, Lord, I will stop doing, I will, I will lose this. Now, you give up something, but that's not enough. What does he say in the next verse? Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. Suffered the loss of all things. So, not only we lose, we suffer the loss of it. Meaning, there will also be some pain involved. Some people say, I gave this up and I never felt anything. That means there's no suffering involved. Of course, God will give us grace. Not that we're going to sit and cry and cry. That's also not good. I remember once there was a testimony. It was a servant of God who left everything to follow Jesus. And he stood up to testify and he said, I had so much this and I had so much that and this was my qualification and I had this huge bus and it has this and it had that and it, then I had this and then I had that and I had this and I gave up everything for Jesus. Pastor Don walked up and said, you gave up down. Reminding him because he was actually counting it all very precious. We give up something for Jesus and then we become proud. See, I did this, I did that. It becomes an achievement. We are not suffering, we are enjoying it. But St. Paul says, I lost something and I suffered. There will be some pain involved. It's a little example. When I was in college, I had entered after my school, I had gone to college. Um, probably towards the, yeah, in the beginning of my college years, I became a little interested in public speaking. Actually, I'm a very, very timid person. If, if I tell you my story, you'll say, okay, come on, can you just tell, tell about yourself? Because I am very, very, very shy by nature. Very afraid to talk to new people. I'd start crying. That's who I am. But then, I suddenly developed a little bit of confidence when I came to college. And then I wanted to improve on it. And I started realizing it was working out. And then I began to speak. And I began to impress my friends. And I began to impress my teachers. And then I thought, wow, this is an opportunity. Let me start speaking but in my heart I felt the Holy Spirit saying whatever talent or gift I give you don't use it for the world I said come on God this is not the world it is after all my college and if there's going to be a competition why can't I be part of it <clears throat> and uh, I went for a tarry meeting and it so happened today we had all these testimonies about tarry meetings I also went for a tarry meeting and the pastor was there. And this pastor is someone who doesn't know me from Adam. He doesn't know anything about the difficulty I'm facing. He doesn't know anything about what's going on in my head. And he was sitting there and he was saying, hallelujah, hallelujah. You know the pastors there, they do that, you know. So he's sitting there and doing that and doing that and doing that and doing that. Suddenly he stopped in front of the mic. If God has given you a talent, then don't use it for the world. And he went like that and he went like that and he went. And I sat there dumbfounded, shell-shocked, flabbergasted, 
I said, what? God, that's you. It can't be him. It's you. And then I said, okay. Lord, I won't use this for the world. I will dedicate my voice for you. I said that. And then it started. Oh, the struggles and the temptation. Many inter-college competitions and all kinds of competitions, they started coming up. And they said, we need somebody. And then they all turned and they looked at me. And I knew it. Okay. They said, Rohit, you have to do it. I said, no, I can't. Why? You know, because I'm born again. They said, okay, you're born again, whatever that means. Now, can you, can you talk again? I said, no, I can't. Why? Why? No, I didn't know why. No, I didn't know how to explain why. The problem was, I knew it was wrong. But I kind of lingered around. You know it's wrong, but you just linger around. Okay, I know I can't do it, but let me see what I can't do. Okay, there's something I can't do. You know what I can't do? I can't do what they're doing. So what are they doing? You know, they're talking. Oh, there's a situation. And I lingered and lingered. And I felt the temptation. Oh, it was so hard. And then I said, okay, I won't talk, but I will train you to talk. So I lingered there and I said, oh, they said, okay, how do we do it? I said, when you start talking, don't start with the subject. Just start from, you know, some, from somewhere, something that doesn't, something irrelevant. Say, there was a situation where I was standing in the court and the judge stood and stared at me and said, in 10 days you're going to be dead. And you stand like that. And what happens? Just like all of you are looking at me, then everybody will be looking at you. And I was, I was and then that fellow said, excuse me, I can't talk like that. Can you talk? I said, well, God, does it have to be so hard? Please, Father, you understand, isn't it? He understands, Lord, don't misunderstand. You, you, oh, why? What was the problem? I didn't want to suffer the loss of it. I made the covenant, but I don't want to go through the pain. But praise God. Finally, he gave me the grace to go away from that place. And I never knew that two years later I would be in the ministry. I would be serving him. And from then on, I've, sta I've, I've started talking and I can't stop. I'm sorry about it. Anyway, so this is what I mean by making covenants. Lord, I give this to you. I dedicate this for you. That is making it sacred, that is consecration. I will not use this for a mundane, worldly purpose. I lend my voice for you. I lend my service for you. I give myself to you. If you've made a covenant like that, you will suffer loss. It's not a bad thing, it's a good thing because that is giving value to your covenant. Now let me go into another aspect of making a covenant because some of you have made a covenant and then you're wondering, why did I make it? What happens is some people, some believers, they make covenants in times of difficulty. Like for example, Lord, if you heal me, I will serve you. How many of you made that covenant? Lord, if you heal me, next August I'll be filling up the form. And God heals you. Well, Lord, I hope you understand, I'm a person who's very rash, you know, I just make all these fancy decisions, you know, you understand, isn't it? Come on, God, you, you know, you know, right? Anyway, by the way, I'm very grateful for the healing. You did your part and my part, sir. Lord, you give me the grace. Until you give the grace, I will carry on. So we see, we are making a covenant just to get out of the trouble, isn't it? Did we really mean it when we made the covenant? It's better not to make a covenant than to make it and not keep it. If you read Numbers chapter 30, Numbers chapter 30, verse 2 and verse 3. Numbers 30, 2 and 3. If a man vow a vow unto the Lord or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall, 
he shall not break his word he shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth if a woman also vow a vow unto the lord and bind herself by a bond being in her father's house okay, in her that's, youth that's understood so here we understand that if it was a person who vows a vow then he must keep it better it is for a man not to make a vow than to make it and break it why does the bible say that because the bible gives so much value to the covenants or the vows that we make so if you have made a vow and you have broken it saying i can't keep it it's too hard i want you to consider a situation you know suppose there is a certain covenant that god wants you to make so the question i'm going to deal with now is is it right to make covenants in times of trouble is it right is that right okay i'm going to answer that with with this explanation look at it from another angle you are saying i was in trouble and then i made that covenant okay so you made that covenant because of the trouble trouble came then the covenant came that's what you say but that's the way you are looking at it but look at it from another angle suppose god wants you to make a certain covenant he speaks to you and you don't obey he speaks in different ways and you don't obey so what happens there is no future in your relationship with god your future is going to be a godless future because you have not entered into that relationship with god if you don't enter into that relationship you have no future with him but god wants that future with you so what does he do he speaks you don't obey so there's only one thing he can do he has to push you into trouble for you to make that covenant i remember one uh, many years ago there was a pastor called pastor cj matthew he was uh, our pastor and he said he was in a congregation where there were believers and there was one particular believer who had these fancy earrings and she wouldn't remove them she just kept on and she would just wear them all the time and one day he did something as he was giving communion he went and held her ear and then went past i don't know how much she would have cursed him for doing that she must have been really 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 upset fuming 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 she walked out of the church walked down the street on the way she fell into a manhole only her head remained on top her hands were inside and then she said lord i will remove my earrings don't wait for god to push you into a manhole to make a covenant to obey him you can do it even outside the manhole it's cleaner though hygienic so if there is no other way if there is no other way for god to do it then he may have to push you into some kind of trouble to make that covenant making covenants to get out of trouble is wrong making covenants to get out of trouble in itself is wrong but listen carefully sometimes it is god who pushed you into that trouble to help you make that covenant that is what you must understand so let's consider the example of one man in the bible he was a judge in the bible in the old testament probably the 8th or 9th judge of israel whose name was jephtha and we've all heard of him we've read of him briefly once this being a judge he was the leader of the israelites and he was leading the nation in a war and they were going to fight a battle against the ammonites now when he saw the enemy coming against him now you can compare it to your situation you're thinking of your future how am i going to face my future how am i going to face this huge situation so what do you do you start thinking lord if you help me then i will do this so that is what jephtha did he said lord if you fight this battle for me then i am going to make a covenant with you what is the covenant he made you read judges chapter 11 30 to 32 judges 11 30 to 32 and jephtha vowed a vow unto the lord and said if thou shall without fail deliver the children of ammon into into mine hand 
then it shall be that whoso whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me when i return in peace from the children of the ammon shall surely be the lords and i will offer it up for a burnt offering so jephthah passed over unto the children of ammon to fight against them and the lord delivered them into his hands praise the lord what was the vow that jephthah made he said lord I am now in a heat of a battle with the Ammonites and the children of Ammon are too strong for me. But God, if in this situation you give me the victory, if you deliver these Ammonites into my hand, then Lord, when I return, as I'm walking into my house, whatever comes out of my house, I'm going to offer that to you as a burnt offering. What is the next thing that happened in the battle? We read God delivered the Ammonites into his hand. Now that itself shows us the value of making a covenant with God. But there's a question that we have to ask. Did God give him victory because he made the covenant? Or would God have given him the victory anyway even had he not made the covenant? Who can answer that question? Is it this or is it that? First question. Oh, first part of it. Did God give him the victory because he made that covenant? Or would God have given him the victory anyway? Which means the covenant was not necessary. A or B? Any all those who say A, put up your hand. God gave him the victory because he made that covenant. I mean, don't worry, there's, there's no harm being wrong. You're not Mr. Perfect, come on. Okay. So many of you didn't put up your hand for A, so probably B. All those who say God would have given him the victory, even if he had not made the covenant. Hands up. About 15 people have put up their hands in total. What happened to the rest of you? Oh, both. Now hang on, how does it work out both? God made him make that covenant and still... What? It doesn't make sense. Okay, those who say both. What is this? Those who say, I don't know. Even that is very few. Brother Tiran, what did you put up your hand for? I'm catching you today. You come closer and closer to Dublin, that's it. Your problem will be Dublin. Okay. You didn't lift your hand up for A, B. You're waiting for C, there's no C. Shabu? I don't know. Ah. That's the best option. I don't know. You're safe because you're not wrong by saying I don't know. Anyway, those who said A, your answer is wrong. Those who said B, your answer is wrong. Both are wrong. What is the answer? It's not, it's not that, it's not that God would have given him the victory anyway had he not even made the covenant. That's not the way you look at it. The fact is, God made Jephthah make that covenant. Read the previous verse. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he passed over Gilead and Manasseh, and passed over Mizpah of Gilead, and from Mizpah to of Gilead he passed over unto the children of Ammon. And then, next verse. And Jephthah vowed a vow right. unto... Right, you see, what happened in the previous verse? He had an anointing. The Spirit of God came upon him, and the next thing he did is to make that covenant. It was God who made or urged him to make that covenant. Because God wanted to give Jephthah the victory. But he could give the victory only through a covenant. So it was God, the Spirit of God who made Jephthah make that covenant. So now that is clear. God was behind the covenant. But what was the price or what was the sacrifice? What was the awful thing that happened? Jephthah said, whatever comes out of my house, 
I will offer as a burnt offering. Now read verse 34 and verse 35. And Jephthah came to Mizpah to his house and behold his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and with dances and she was his only child. Beside her he had neither son nor daughter and it came to pass when he saw her that he rent his clothes and said Alas my daughter thou hast brought me very low and thou art one of them that trouble me for I have opened my mouth unto the Lord and I cannot go back Can you imagine the heart of this father Any fathers here with an only child put up your hand Fathers with an only child Uh, Jacob, Bruno, uh, only daughter, you see, you can really understand Jephthah today. Uh, he said, Jephthah was shocked. He had not anticipated this at all. You know, what do you think was in his mind when he made the covenant? What did he think would come out? He was thinking maybe a calf or a sheep or something how do you know how do you know his mind what was the covenant he made he said lord whatsoever not like sister jason first read she read whosoever then she corrected and said whatsoever he said he was very clear about his covenant he said whatsoever comes out of my house i will offer it to you and then he looked in horror it was his daughter now sister florence has made a covenant and she says whatsoever and then suddenly she says helen coming out said god i'm sure you understand grammar i said whatsoever not whomsoever so helen can you just pass by i'm waiting i'm waiting for the next thing to come you know we know how to you know adjust our covenants and you know we know how to sharpen it this way that way and so that it really fits us but look at this man he's such a guileless man because he knows it's nothing to do with grammar first of all it's in hebrew i don't know how it's in hebrew but the fact is he meant anything that comes out anyone or anything and he knows what he meant from his heart and here comes his daughter what would you do in that place what would you do brother jacob hmm? you are in a situation probably you are on a plane and then you just heard that the plane is about to crash and you say god no no lord please spare my life spare my life if you spare my life lord as i go home whatever i see first i will give away to your house i will do this i will do that and as soon as you come becky comes running daddy and you say oh no what you going to say huh <laughs> okay okay here is a daddy who says if it is not sacrifice meaning like not a human sacrifice others you give okay after this meeting you just pack her in a bag and put her in the phaeton car okay it's so easy to sit there and make that statement because he never would make that covenant he'll be so careful whatsoever god what okay what not whom eh whatsoever lord i hope you understood whatsoever just imagine jacob with that predicament he sees his daughter and what's he going to say bless ye the lord Behold bless ye the Lord he's not going to say oh god i bless you he is going to smite his chest and he's going to fall down crumpled in a heap he won't shave he'll be sitting there like a sanyasi he won't eat he won't drink he'll say i don't know what to do i need help call the servants of god jephtha was in that state he did not know what to do you see why was he struggling because he knew he could not go back on his word see he knew that a covenant meant sacrifice you know sometimes to help a person in the family keep that covenant we have to help one another and you know in this i really appreciate 
one person and that is Jephthah's daughter. Just imagine, you know, if a father says, Lord, my child is sick like this. Uh, if you heal, you now Julian has said, Lord, by the way, Bruno put up his hand, Julian didn't put up his hand. Is that by faith or? Anyway, okay. So, now Julian makes a covenant. Lord, delight us having earache. And if you heal her, did you ever say anything like that? You didn't. You won't, will you? So, if you heal her, I will surrender her to serve you. And the Lord heals her and he thinks, oh no. But no, I have made that covenant. Then Sister Jacinth has to help him. You know, Julian or Jew or whatever you call him. You know, you see, we've made this covenant. We have to keep it. You have to encourage him. You have to support. 20 years later, Julian tells, Delighta, my darling. You know, we made a covenant and blah, blah, blah. He goes into it and she says, who asked you to make that covenant about me? If you want, you go and serve God. I'm an individual. Leave me alone. What happens? And now, of course, she's, you can't see her, but you know, like a few years from now, obviously she's going to become a little taller. Then will she still be this little, you know, you know, as we grow up, what happens? You see, but what do we see in Jephthah's family? Jephthah was struggling. He said, oh, daughter, what have you done? Why did you come out? Couldn't you have stayed in that blessed house for two minutes and pushed a cow out for goodness sake? Why did you come out? Now, what did his daughter do? Read verse 36. And she said unto him, my father, if thou hast opened thy mouth unto the Lord, do to me according to that which hath proceeded out of thy mouth, for as much as the Lord hath taken vengeance for thee of thine enemies, even of the children of the children of Ammon. Can you see this daughter? What a spiritual, godly child she must be. So she helped her father. She supported her father. She did not say, you know, in, you will never find this in the present age. Present age with political correctness and lateral thinking. Daughters will say, excuse me, dad, if you went off your head, don't expect me to follow suit. Who asked you to open your mouth? That's why never open your mouth. You, you got a rash mouth, dad. You open your mouth, you say all these horrible things. That's why you can carry on. I'm not going to keep to it. But look at this daughter. Daddy, if you made that covenant, here am I. Do with me what you have promised to God. One last question. What did he do with her? What did he say? He said, I will offer whatsoever comes out, I will offer for a burnt offering. I have often been asked this question. Did Jephthah finally offer his daughter for a burnt offering? I'm not going to say that my answer is the right answer, but I will share with you whatever my opinion is. Because the Bible doesn't tell us very clearly, yes, he put her on the altar, he cut her into 12 pieces and tossed her into the fire. No, the Bible doesn't say that. So let us try and understand, but I always speak under correction. Now, first of all, according to Leviticus chapter 18, verse 21, God forbids human sacrifice. Leviticus 18:21. And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Molech, neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God, for I am the Lord. God was against sacrificing their children. They used to offer, the heathen used to offer their children to Molech or to the fire God. And God said, I am against it, I am against that. And that is why, though he tested Abraham, he'd forbid him, he forbade him from offering Isaac as a human sacrifice. God is against human sacrifice. And also, when we turn to, well, we understood from Judges 11.31, when Jephthah said, Lord, whatsoever comes out, in his mind, in his heart, he was telling God, Lord, it is an animal. So, if Jephthah offered a human being to God, how would God accept it? 
And if he did finally go against his the truth, what God has said, don't offer human sacrifice. Had he said, sorry, I have to do it. Then in Hebrews 11.32, Jephthah would not have been mentioned as a hero of faith. Jephthah's name would have been taken off as one who disobeyed God's command in Leviticus 18, 21, not to offer a human sacrifice. But there is another option. What he must have done with his daughter is that he must have dedicated her to live a life of celibacy or to live unmarried for the rest of her life. There is a little hint to that in the chapter if you read judges chapter 11 verse 37 listen to her words why would a girl who's going to die as being offered as a burnt offering why would she say these words unless of course it was celibacy and she said unto her father let this thing be done for me let me let me alone two months that i may go up and down upon the mountains and bewail my virginity i and my fellows so she said, Lord, let me be alone with my friends for two months. Because probably he was going to give her to be to a life of celibacy. We don't know what kind of you know, priesthood or what there was at that time. But for him, his daughter supported him in that. So we understand in the end, God accepted his sacrifice. Let us understand from all these examples how precious these Old Testament saints were and how they valued their covenants. He, he, it was his only child and his child was not going to be married. And think of it as parents. You have an only child and you give that child to serve God. Yes, it is a loss, but it is not a loss. If you know what you're gaining, if you have your eyes on the kingdom of God, if you have your eyes on heaven, oh, I'll tell you, there is such a glorious thing. That is why we need to have a heavenly vision. What we lose here is a gain up there. If you don't look at the up there part of it, you'll only look at the loss. You will only see. In that case, you can't even buy anything in a shop. You give money, you get something. If you don't see the something you're getting, you wouldn't, oh, I don't want to lose 10 euros. I'm losing money. No. You're gaining something. So through every sacrifice we make, we are gaining something. God must therefore open our eyes to be able to see what we are gaining and not what we are losing. What does the wise man do? The wise man will lose what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Let us therefore be wise. Jesus is coming soon to gather the saints unto whom those saints who have made a covenant with him by sacrifice.